So welcome to one of our Expert Connection uh, sessions. Um, so I'm Richard Akers, one of the Water Watch coordinators in our Citizen Science Monitoring Team. Uh, we have Ben Hudson, who is running this presentation as well. Um, and um, yeah, we've got a, a great chat lined up being put together by um, Josh, who I'll introduce in a second. Uh, so just a little bit of housekeeping. We do have people's microphones and uh, videos turned off. Um, but if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, you've got the little chat feature in uh, Zoom, you can just type stuff in too. We'll keep an eye on that. And at the end of Josh's presentation, um, Ben's going to, to run through those questions uh, and um, hopefully we'll have time to, to get through all those before Josh has to run away for his next uh, obligations. Um, You've also got the option uh, to vote um, against questions uh, that come up in the chat as well, giving them a little thumbs up. So yeah, if there's there's some that you, you know people have asked that um, everyone sort of likes, you can kind of give it a bit of a high priority, but hopefully we we'll get through all those questions. Um, and um, if you have any other um, questions after this webinar, if you want to know more about you know platypus um, or about the citizen science programs that we run with Melbourne Water, um, we'll have a contact email up on uh, at the end of the presentation, get in touch with us, um, or just, yeah, basically it's waterwatch at melbournewater.com.au to get in touch with us for, for more information. Uh, we'll be recording this and putting it up online a little bit later. Um, and um, yeah, we might just jump straight into it. Um, so um, before I hand over to Josh, we'd just like to uh, acknowledge um, the country that we're working on today. So Melbourne Water acknowledges the tr Victorian traditional, traditional owners um, and their elders past and present as the original custodians of Victoria's land and waters. Uh, and we pay our respects to the elders past and present and to the ongoing living culture of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So I'm working on Bunurong country today. Um, ben and Josh, did you want to let us know which countries you're working on today? Um, well, I'm usually in uh, Gunnarkurnai land out in East Gippsland, but today I'm in Melbourne as well myself. Um, oh, so I would be on uh, Wurundjeri land today. Brilliant. And I'm also on Bunurong country. Fantastic. Cool. Um, all right. Um, so we might, um, I'll just introduce Josh. So Josh Griffiths is a wildlife ecologist with um, the research groups Caesar and EnviroDNA. Uh, he specialises in working with the iconic platypus species. Uh, and today Josh is going to be talking to us about his work on platypus and the results from um, quite a few programs that have been working on platypus um, recently. So the Great Australian Platypus Search, Melbourne Water's Urban Platypus Monitoring Program and some community EDA monitoring programs that are having as well. So I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll hand over to you, Josh. All right. Thanks, Richard. I'll, um, oops, that's the wrong button. All right. I'll just share my screen, which hopefully will work smoothly. All right, so hopefully everyone can now see my screen. Maybe Richard or Ben, can you just give me a, a thumbs up to make sure that's okay? Yep, that's all good. Beautiful. Okay, let's jump into it. Yeah, so thanks. As, as Richard mentioned, I'm going to um, provide you a lot of info today. Um, I'm going to present a, a bit of an overview about a, a range of monitoring programs that's been going on in, in the Melbourne area, um, largely through uh, Melbourne Waters monitoring programs over the last 25 years, I think, for platypus. This is really unique. We don't have the kind of data on platypus anywhere else in Australia that we do in Melbourne. Um, and that's because of these, these long running programs. So, um, and, and also we don't have the kind of data in an urban environment. So, you know, it's great that we've got platypuses in our, our urban areas. Um, but obviously there's a lot of challenges that they face. It's a very modified landscape, very modified waterways. And that presents a lot of challenges to, to platypuses and, and other species. So um, there will be a lot of info, um, but plenty of time for questions at, at the end. So just to back up, I'm sure for, for those of you that have been to my talks before, you would have heard some of this stuff, but I just want to highlight what a incredible critter this guy is and and why it's really important that we that we um you know protect them i think they're one of the most unique species of in the world um and it's because of a lot of these features so this also helps understand some of the threats that they face and some of their habitat requirements so of course as we know they're a semi-aquatic mammal um that's pretty unique in itself there's not many uh, aquatic mammals around the world 
Um, and they're very well adapted to that environment. So some people say that they're, they're quite primitive in, in, their, um, in the characteristics they have, but it's simply because they are so well evolutionary adapted to the environment they live in, they haven't had to change over a, a lot of time. Um, now, they, they are mostly nocturnal. It's certainly not unusual to see them out during the day. Um, of course, it's the only time we're going to see them, but they do spend, it's about three quarters, two thirds of their time active at night, um, but they're very adaptable at different times of the year and, and different uh, individuals are going to be active at different times of the day. Uh, and that also makes them challenging to, in a monitoring perspective. When they're not in the water, the other critical uh, habitat requirement they have is that they need banks that they're able to construct their burrows in. So banks that are nicely, uh, well, earthen for starters, um, but also consolidated by vegetation roots that's going to hold all the soil together. And they have a couple of different burrows. They have a, a, an everyday burrow that they'll, they'll probably have multiple ones throughout their home range. They're only around two to five metres long. But uh, around this time, well, this time of the year, um, there'll be juveniles just coming out of the maternal burrow um, that the, the females construct those during spring. And these can be up to 25, 30 metres long, which is quite an impressive feat for a, for a little platypus. Um, there is quite a lot of variation in their size. So like most mammals, males are, are bigger than females. But there's also a latitudinal gradient. So up in Queensland, you get quite small platypuses and in Tassie, you get giant furry logs in the waterways. So um, I think the largest one I caught in Tassie was about three and a half kilos. Um, here in Melbourne, the largest we've got is about 2.7, um, which was still, still pretty impressive. The other thing that's really relevant is that these guys are, are fairly slow reproducers. They're not like rabbits, so populations don't fluctuate rapidly. Um, they breed once a year in Victoria, that is um, from late winter to early spring. Um, and then typically females will lay anything from one to three eggs, typically only raise one young at a time and they won't reproduce every year. So females that have produced young in one year typically won't have, uh, won't even reproduce the, the next year. So their population growth is, is quite slow. And that's really important when we see declines in populations is that they don't bounce back rapidly. It, it takes quite a lot of time. Um, one of the most critical parts of their habitat is uh, their food supply. So these guys aren't really fussy about what they eat, but they do require a, a lot of food and that's mostly aquatic invertebrates. So a lot of what we talk about in terms of improving habitat for platypuses is actually improving habitat for their bugs. And then one of their other really unique features is that they're, they're actually venomous. So males have venomous spurs on their hind legs. Uh, it's quite a unique uh, venom. In humans, it causes excruciating pain. And I think I've got a, that's gonna come up. This is what the spur looks like here. Um, in, in, yeah, in, in humans, it causes uh, excruciating pain and, and swelling and things like our opiates have no effect on it. So if you do, if you are ever unlucky enough to be spurred, it's a, it's a trip to hospital and some nerve blockers for you. So given what we know about their, their habitat and their requirements, what are the kind of threats that they face? So obviously as an aquatic species, their key requirement is water. Now, that's also something that we require as humans, and so we've often changed their, their habitat. We remove water from their areas. Um, you know, we had the millennium drought in the first decade of this um, century, which, you know, reduced our, our nice flowing waterways to a series of ponds. So it, it reduces the amount of habitat that's available. It reduces their food availability. It changes water quality. We exacerbate that by taking water out of their habitat or creating, diverting water, creating reservoirs. That's probably the biggest threat that they face across Australia. The other major threat they face is clearing vegetation around the waterways. So what goes on in a broader catchment has a lot of um, influence on what goes on in the waterway itself. So removing those, those um, that vegetation around waterways, you end up with bank erosion, you end up with changes in water quality, um, you lose that woody debris and organic matter that goes into waterways. 
um, you know, invasive species, replacing our native veg changes the nature of our waterways as well. And then, of course, when we have stock access in, uh, in areas, it just exacerbates the problem. We have massive issues with bank erosion and contamination in waterways. So they're probably the, the big threats they face. Um, at a more local level, we certainly see some issues with, with predation um, and that's introduced predators. They don't really have any natural predators. Uh, things like litter, which is incredibly relevant in, in urban areas, and we see typically around 5 to 7% of all of our animals have, have sign of litter entanglement in Melbourne. And um, thankfully, these, these traps are, have been eradicated. So these are opera house traps that are used to catch yabbies. Um, historically, they've, they've been um, you know, identified to be drowning a, a lot of platypus. These were banned a couple of years ago. And since they were banned in all waterways in Victoria, we have not had a single death recorded. So that's been a, a, a great little win for the, for the platypus. So the other thing about platypus is that they're, they're just difficult to, to monitor. So um, traditionally, we go out and do, do trapping surveys. Um, and that's because we can't simply go out and, and look for platypus in waterways. Um, they can be very difficult to spot. They're very um, widely dispersed. And when you do see them, they might look like a little stick in the distance like this. It's often going to be late in the afternoon or early morning, so the light's not very good. They're easily mistaken for our other native uh, aquatic mammal, the rakali. And as I mentioned before, they're mostly active at night, which you know, poses some fairly obvious problems. So typically, um, you know, traditionally, this is how we used to monitor platypuses. We would do live trapping surveys. We'd set these nets in a number of locations along a waterway, and then we've got to monitor them all night so that we can remove any fish. We can make sure that platypus aren't, aren't stuck in them for too long. Um, we can quickly get them out and, and back in the water really quickly. So it's a very time and labour intensive process. Um, but does yield some really good data. And, and that's what we've been doing in, in Melbourne for since about the mid 90s. So we actually have a, a quite an amazing data set. Um, so this is the, the Melbourne area for those that are, are familiar. Uh, the Melbourne CBD is in the middle here. This is the Yarra River heading out to, to the east. Werribee is, is over here. Um, this is just a very broad overview of uh, uh, the trapping program that's been done in Melbourne over, over 20 years. So each of these markers represents a spot where nets have been set, orange is where platypus have been recorded, and grey is where they haven't. And so this is, this is a summary of 20 years of, of data. So generally what we've seen in these areas, we've so Keeping in mind, this is very much overlaid by the millennium drought, which has been the, the, the biggest sort of influence over this period. What we've set, oh, so each of these areas represent, these little clusters represent a, a, a survey night. Um, these are typically surveyed in spring and autumn each year. And um, as I mentioned, many of these have been surveyed for, for 20 years or so. So we, we use a, a metric called, um, captures per unit effort. So it's a measure of abundance of, of platypus. And um, it's, it's basically the number of platypus that's captured in any survey standardized by the number of nets we put out so that we can compare across time. Now, unfortunately, a, a, a lot of areas that we've been to, we've seen dramatic declines in platypus and they've either disappeared or are now at very low abundance in, in areas. Other areas over that period have been relatively consistent. But probably the most common picture we see is things like this, where we've seen uh, a fairly significant decline, but then a bit of a recovery over the last five or six years. Um, and a couple of years ago, we did some, some modelling around this to sort of combine all of the data. And this is the, the typical pattern that we've seen over the 20-odd over the years of, of monitoring. Uh, so a dramatic decline followed by a bit of recovery. Um, error margins at either ends of these models are, are fairly large, and I, I would say that our recovery isn't quite at, at this level yet. Um, but that's the general pattern that we've seen over time. And not surprisingly, this is the, the millennium drought period. So typically, drought has resulted in de decline in populations. We see a bit of a lag before populations start to recover recover. 
Um, and now the good news is that they are trending in the right direction, but they're not quite back to, to pre-drought levels just yet. Now, while trapping gives us some really good data, um, it also has some, some limitations. So over the last probably half a dozen years, we've been working very closely with, with Melbourne Water and, and other organisations to um, implement or, or verify a new technique called environmental DNA, which I'm sure many of you are, have been familiar with. Um, but for those that aren't, basically it means that we can um, look at water samples and detect tiny traces of DNA that, that all species leave behind. So it means that we don't have to see or trap or observe uh, platypus to know that they're there or not, um, which means it's a, it's a non-invasive technique, which is, you know, as ecologists, we always try to minimise um, impacts on species. And so this is one way that we can do that. Um, for those of you that have been involved, you can probably attest to the fact that the, the sampling methodology is relatively simple. And that was something that we hadn't really considered at the time, but it's enabled us to involve, um, you know, community groups like yourselves to be actively involved in, um, in monitoring programs and produce some really good data. And I guess importantly for any monitoring technique, first of all, it's highly sensitive. So we know that we've got a very good chance of picking up platypus if they're present and it's cost effective. So we can do things at, at scales that we've never done before. And it's not as limited as trapping. You know, it's very easy to go out and take water samples, whereas we're very restricted on where we can put traps in, in our waterways. So it, it's another tool that we can use, and it means that we're able to collect more data on, on platypuses than we've never been able to do before. Um, so for those of you that, that haven't done the water sampling, it's as simple as going out to a, a waterway, collecting a, a water sample using a, a sterile syringe. Um, that then goes through a very fine filter. The filter then goes back to the lab and we've got a, a team of geneticists that are very good at their job and do all the complicated stuff and um, tell us whether there's platypus present or, or not. What that means, I'm not going to get too much into the laboratory stuff, um, but basically what we do when a sample comes into the lab is that we extract all of the DNA from that, and that's going to be DNA from a variety of different species. There's going to be fish and turtles and frogs and even stuff that lives around the waterways. Um, so the challenge for us is to work out, well, how do we how do we find platypus DNA in that sort of soup of, of, of DNA from a, uh, a number of different species? And the way that we do it is that we can design a, a probe that uh, is specific to a, a small section of the platypus gene. So it's only going to bind to matching DNA from the platypus. And we've got to be very careful about how we design and, and verify that probe to make sure it's doing what it's, uh, what it's supposed to. When that gets added to the sample, it'll bind to its target DNA. And when that happens, it lets off a little fluorescent signal. And that's what we can measure in our samples to say whether platypus are there or not, and also to be able to quantify the amount of DNA in a sample. So that's as technical as I'm going to get, but I, I thought that might be of interest to, to some of you. So what does that look like? So again, if we go back to our, our Melbourne catchments, all of these little coloured locations are our previous trapping data. So this is just a, another way of looking at that map that I showed you before. And I've just colour coded it um, to give a bit of a, a rating as to the health of each of these populations. So green populations are, are relatively healthy and, and abundant and good habitat. Red populations, on the other hand, are typically fairly isolated and, and low abundance. Our white areas here are where um, platypus no longer occur. And so even though we've got relatively good data over that, uh, you know, pretty large area, there's still also some, some very large gaps in there. So back in 2016, when we were looking at how we could use eDNA, we did some pretty widespread surveys across the Melbourne area. Um, so it was around just over 300 sites that we looked at. Um, and so here we've got our, our green markers are where we detected platypus DNA, our white ones are where we didn't detect it, and our yellow ones are where we've detected really faint traces, which might be that the platypus is present, but it can come from other sources as well. So these are possible detections. 
And you can very quickly see that there's some, um, you know, really clear patterns in, in the upper Yarra region. We get a lot of green markers, whereas out in the west where it's a bit drier and a lot of, um, you know, cleared agricultural land, we get much fewer um, detections of platypus. And that matches really closely with what we've seen with our trapping data as well, which, which is great. Um, a couple of years after that, we repeated these surveys. Um, and again, very similar patterns through here. I should point out that you certainly do get a bit of variation over time. So, you know, some, even though the overall patterns are going to remain the same, you are going to get um, different detections uh, at a site level. So platypus might be present at site one, but uh, at time point one, but not at time point two and, and vice versa. So um, the site level data isn't as, as important as that overall um, picture. And so the other thing we can do with this is, so we, we, we move away a little bit from talking about platypus abundance to a, a different metric called site occupancy, which is really the, the number of sites that we detected platypuses um, in a particular catchment area. And the other day, I just really quickly match that up with our uh, our abundance trapping data. So the blue columns here are our, our measure of abundance from our trapping data, and the orange is our site occupancy from uh, our eDNA. And you can see the patterns are, are very similar. So you get a little bit of variation, but typically where you get low abundance platypus, you get lower site occupancy. Um, so they're just different ways of looking at essentially the same thing. It's a measure of population health. Um, we know populations are relatively healthy in the upper Yarra and they're struggling in, in you know, Werribee and, and Dandenong. So um, different tools that are, are, are different ways of looking at, at much the, the same thing. As part of this, we also had a, a number of little localised citizen science projects in uh, Mombok Creek, in the Werribee system, and more recently in Cannibal Creek. So I'll just give you a very brief overview about each of those. So in um, uh, Mombok Creek, so this is uh, Belgrave here, uh, Mombok Creek flowing to the left of your screen. And from all of our trapping data, we, we know that the population has declined fairly dramatically in this creek and is now fairly restricted to this uh, um, bolder blue line here. Um, they've disappeared from this lower part of Mombok Creek. Um, the other thing that's been really interesting here is in the last probably three or four years, Melbourne Water has been doing a lot of habitat improvements in this uh, area here to try to improve habitat for platypuses and, and hopefully expand that population. So, um, so back in 2015, we get a couple of detections in the area where we expect platypus to occur, but also a number of negative, air, negative sites as well. And that's really typical of a low abundant population. And you'll find that those positive detections are going to change from, from year to year. So in 2016, Again, a couple of positives, but, but plenty of negatives and, and not much in this lower section. So we can just sort of roll through from year to year. We would occasionally get some very faint possible detections in this lower section, but, but nothing confirmed. So this could be transient animals that are temporarily using the area. It might simply be DNA that's being flushed down the system a little bit. Um, but it gives hints that, that platypus might be using that lower section. Um, and as we move through to 20, our last monitoring program in 2021, we're starting to see an increase in the number of positive detections in that, in that core area, but we finally got a positive detection in this lower area. So all of this is indicating that the population is, is starting to increase, um, as we've seen from our trapping data, but also that it's, it's starting to expand into that lower section. And um, you know, that's likely to be in response of both improved flows from, from rainfall, but also the habitat improvements that's been um, implemented through that area. Now in the Werribee system, we um, it's a little bit more variable. We don't have uh, a, a nice a consistency, I guess, of the monitoring sites through there. So it was difficult to show a, a timeline like I did with Mombok Creek. But the patterns, um, I guess the overall pattern is what I want to talk about here. So 
down in Werribee Township, we get pretty consistent detections there. We know there's a small resident population there. Um, if we go upstream, we, we tend to get sporadic detections through this area into mixed with a, a few negatives. So again, that, that's indicating that there's quite low abundance through that area, although they, they are still present. But what's been really exciting about this, uh, through this monitoring is further north. So we know there's been a very small isolated population in Werribee Gorge here, but over the last four or five years, we're starting to get detections of platypuses through the Bacchus Marsh region. So they've been absent from that area for um, during the millennium drought, and we're starting to get regular but also inconsistent detections through that area. So that also correlates with um, a number of community sightings that's been um, collected by the Bacchus Marsh Platypus Alliance. Uh, and more recently, early last year, there was some trapping done in there. And I think there was two or three animals um, captured for the first time in a, in a number of years. So um, this has been a really nice story that platypus population is starting to expand, um, which is great given that the overall picture has been declining population. So uh, again, improved conditions, platypus are moving into areas that they haven't been for, for some time. Now in um, Cannibal Creek here, um, these pink dots are, are markers that were, were collected by the Landcare group there. Now that wasn't specifically to look at platypus, it was looking at sort of broader biodiversity stuff, um, particularly a, a threatened fish species. So we didn't actually pick up platypus at, at any of these sites. Um, a lot of them were actually off stream basins, so that's not surprising, but we've certainly found platypus along Cannibal Creek from our regular monitoring. And again, this sort of pattern of some detections and some non-detections along the creek um, are showing that there is a resident population there, but it's fairly sparse, it's fairly low abundance. Um, and that's not surprising given the nature of that creek. It's, um, it's a fairly small and it's some, sometimes ephemeral creek, um, but it is connected to the Bunyip system where we've got a relatively healthy population. So we're going to get animals moving in and out of that smaller creek and the larger, larger Bunyip. Um, but interestingly, we do get detections even sort of right up in the um, upper parts of, of Cannibal Creek. Um, now, one of the other projects that was happening around the same time was uh, called the Great Australian Platypus Search, which I'm sure some of you were involved in. Um, this was super exciting. This was a statewide uh, monitoring program and really driven by citizen scientists. So even though we had a, a number of challenges, particularly around COVID at the time, uh, we had so many people that were keen to be involved that it was, a, it was an amazing effort by, um, by the community. So to give you a bit of an overview about what that looks like, um, you know, largest platypus survey ever done, over 2,000 sites across the state. Um, for those of you that are interested, there is a um, webinar that I gave on that a while ago that's been um, recorded that you, can, that you can look up for a bit more detail. But today I'm just gonna focus on, on the Melbourne region again. Um, so uh, within these Melbourne catchments, uh, again, we had a, a, a pretty high density of sampling through the area. Um, and even though we, we probably didn't get as many detections as I was expecting. So this is four years after our um, last eDNA monitoring, but patterns remain much the same. You know, We got detections in the Yarra region, very few through that central urbanised region, and then a, a few sporadic ones to the to the north and uh, west. However, we did get a lot of these possible detections. Now, conditions when this sampling were happened uh, when this sampling happened wasn't great. We we did miss um, breeding season because of COVID, and there was a number of storms through the area. So I suspect that a lot of these possible detections are actually true detections. And they do line up with um, our previous monitoring and also subsequent monitoring. So around the same time, we were doing um, uh, quite intensive sampling with Melbourne water, not just for platypus, but for a range of, of different aquatic species. Um, and I can overlay that. So this is um, part of Melbourne water's sort of ongoing monitoring program. And as I mentioned, not just platypus, but a range of uh, aquatic species very high intensity sampling through 
um, you know, most areas throughout Melbourne. And that's based on some, um, you know, very strong modelling that was done by Monash Uni at the time to be able to say, this is how many sites you need to do to be able to detect change over time. So this was from spring 2021 and uh, autumn 2022. We've just recently completed a, another round of sampling from uh, spring just gone last year, um, but really high intensity sampling. And we get these amazing sort of, um, you know, spatial coverage along most of the waterways throughout Melbourne. Um, and so what we're seeing is, you know, pretty similar, um, you know, even if it's been four years, five years now since the last sampling, we're still seeing very similar patterns of lots of platypuses in these uh, upper sort of less disturbed regions, even coming right down into the middle and, and occasionally lower Yarra. And then we're getting, um, you know, sort of smaller isolated populations in these drier modified catchments out here. Um, but an amazing data set and you can hopefully see how you know using this to track change over time gives us really strong um, power to look at changes in platypus populations and if we overlay what we've done previously um, you know this is one of the most in intensively monitored um, platypus populations ever so um, a lot of what we know about platypuses in urban areas comes from from this program which um, has been really exciting um, finally, I just wanted to touch on, you know, what we can do as, as individuals and, and, as, and as groups. And I think probably the, the key thing, apart from, you know, familiarising yourself with, uh, you know, some of the threats they face and, um, and uh, what's going on with them, I think getting involved with your, your local community group, whether that's Water Watch, whether it's a Friends of, a Landcare group, um, that's how you get involved with these monitoring programs. So whether that's platypus through eDNA, whether it's water bugs or water quality, um, you know, a, a lot of these groups are, are getting involved and, you know, you can contact uh, Ben to find out what's going on in, in your area. Um, these groups also get involved with cleanup days, removing litter from waterways, um, rehabilitation, you know, removing weeds and revegetation, re riparian zones. And it's amazing what a what a small group can do for a local group, uh, local creek. Um, I've seen some amazing jobs, uh, outputs done by a very small group of dedicated people. Um, as individuals, we can also play our part. Of course, you know, using less water, every litre that we don't use can potentially go back to the environment um, to help platypus and, and other species. For those that enjoy a fish, um, I don't want to stop people using their waterways, but making sure that you're responsible with what you do and not leaving lines behind to get entangled in wildlife. Um, controlling dogs around waterways. Uh, again, use your local waterways, make use of them and enjoy them. But, you know, particularly around dawn and dusk, keep your um, your dogs on a lead or under control so they don't, um, uh, you know, get hold of our, our uh, wildlife. And then for those that are living in more regional areas and have a bit of land, you know, contacting Melbourne Water or your local CMA or council to see what can um, be done in terms of stream frontage programs to help um, manage your waterways and, and improve the health. So whew, thank you, everyone. I'm starting to get a little bit croaky, so I might finish there. And um, yeah, I see there's a few questions come through in the chat. So let's jump onto them. Thanks so much, Josh. Um, I'm just blown away by the amount of work that has gone into monitoring the platypus across Melbourne. And, you know, thanks to all the volunteers as well and all that's involved in um, putting collecting this data set. It's, uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty special to um, have such a large monitoring program in Australia, the, probably the largest in Australia. Uh, would you say, Josh? Yeah, definitely, both on uh, a, a time scale, but also spatially. I mean, obviously, the Great Australian Platypus Search was statewide, but it's, it's a one-off. Um, you know, the strength of the Melbourne water data is that we have a timeline and, that, and you sort of need that to be able to track, well, one, track changes over time, but also understand how threats are, are affecting populations. Mm. So to everyone who's attending, um, uh, in the chat function, I've put a couple links out 
ones to the results of the Great Australian Platypus Search, which everyone's free, free to have a look at. Um, it's a really good, uh, easy and accessible map for you all to look at. Um, there's also a link to our Melbourne Water, Water Watch program if you're interested in finding out more and how you can get involved. Um, but I've also left the chat open for questions. Um, some people are using the Q&A function, some people are using the chat. I'll, I'll try get to both all of, all of them within our time frame. I'll start in the chat. Um, so actually, I think the first question came through from Charlotte uh, um, and the question is roughly, Josh, roughly how many platypus would there be in the Yarra Birrarung catchment compared to 20 years ago? Yeah, look, the short answer is, and I hate to say it because I'm supposedly the, the platypus expert, we simply don't know. Um, we cannot estimate platypus numbers even on a local scale, let alone at a catchment scale. Um, and I guess from my point of view and, and probably from a waterway management point of view, the actual numbers aren't as relevant as how that population is changing over time. And so we know in the Yarra region in particular, um, you know, even though the upper area is doing quite well, the lower part of the catchment is really struggling and, and that reflects the changes in um, catchment in those areas. So a lot of the lower area is highly urbanised um, and unfortunately urbanisation doesn't um, treat our waterways very well. So one of the major changes is simply flow regimes. We get very flashy flows when we get a bit of rainfall. When there's no rainfall, it drops quite low. We also get a lot of pollutants and stuff that wash from surrounding areas into those waterways. So um, generally, I so we've certainly seen a, a massive decline over those 20 years. Um, the, the middle and upper is probably getting close to what it was 20 years ago, but unfortunately the lower part of the Yarra is, you know, maybe 10 or 20% of what it used to be. Um, and recovery of those populations is going to be very difficult simply because it's it's very challenging to be able to um, rehabilitate waterways that are now heavily urbanised. Um, certainly things that can be done, but um, it, it's quite difficult to do. So um, I've sort of skirted around that question, but um, hopefully that helps. Sure. Thanks, Josh. Um, from an anonymous attendee, what impact would the recent floods have had on platypus? Yeah, really good question. I've had a number of people um, ask me that over the last 12 months, particularly from New South Wales. So floods, one-off floods, uh, platypus cope with them reasonably well, at least adult platypuses. Where floods can become a, a real problem is when they occur in the summer months, um, which unfortunately our most recent one did. I think it was early December from memory. Um, and the reason for that being is that that's when young are in the burrow. So females lay their eggs around late October and then young platypus are restricted to that burrow until about this time of the year they'll start emerging. When they're in that burrow, they are completely dependent on their mother. Um, they can't forage for themselves. They can't thermoregulate in the early days. And so when we get those floods, they inundate those burrows. And unfortunately, we well, we assume that a lot of those young get drowned uh, or they get washed out and simply can't survive. So um, it will certainly impact their juvenile recruitment for next year. And we, we've certainly seen from our trapping program where we have big summer rainfalls previously, we get very few juveniles the next year. Um, they do tend to then reproduce quite well the week the year after. So it will impact their recruitment, probably not having a massive impact in terms of their overall population. Um, and there's some good benefits from floods in terms of waterway health as well. Where I think we simply don't know is in somewhere like New South Wales, where they've had repeated floods over a 12 month period now, that's probably of much more concern about the kind of impact that's gonna have on, on populations. Thanks, Josh. Um, uh, before I get into any more questions, I'm just gonna put in the chat a feedback quiz that if um, people would um, 
if they have the time to fill out, it would greatly would greatly appreciate the uh, feedback we get from the webinars like we're doing today. Next question from Helen. Josh, can you give me more specific detail? Oh, she didn't finish her question. Um, Vanessa has said, what would the impact of the floods been on local populations? Well, we've just answered that question. Um, About Helen has continued her question about the Mar Maribyrnong sightings. Were they in the lower or upper reaches? Did you test in urban parts of Maribyrnong River and on Mount Macedon streams? From Helen. Yes. So with the program we're doing now with Melbourne Water, um, we are basically testing everywhere. Um, interestingly, we have, so we've always known there's been a, a little population in the upper part of the Maribyrnong and then the adjoining Jackson's Creek up, up to Sunbury. Um, recently, we've actually had detections and, and a few community sightings further down the Maribyrnong. They don't come right down to the very lower reaches, um, or at least not, not permanently. We might get a few sort of lost animals down there, um, but they tend to be fairly restricted to that sort of about Keelor to Sunbury, a little bit north of Sunbury. Um, we do occasionally get platypus as far up as, as Gisborne, um, but it seems to be that's a fairly low abundance, uh, low abundant population in that area. And then the sort of upper deep creek of the Maribyrnong region, um, they are still present, they're still hanging on, um, but unfortunately that creek now has become quite ephemeral. So there's some permanent water holes there that they're surviving in, but um, long term, we're probably expecting them to, to disappear from that area. And that's simply a reflection of the uh, water availability now with climate change. Hope that answers your question, Helen. Um, we have Rob, uh, have breeding programs for reintroduction been considered? Is it practical? Uh, short answer is no, it's it's not practical. Um, there are breeding programs, well, there's reproduction in captivity happening for platypuses. Um, so people weren't, um, the zoos weren't able to breed platypuses for decades. It was very, it was very hard to even keep them alive in captivity. Um, the last decade or so, uh, Hillsville Sanctuary and Taronga Zoo um, are are getting fairly regular um, reproduction happening. I think most years they're, they're getting young. Um, it's not intended for reintroductions at this stage. The kind of numbers you would need for reintroduction simply aren't practical to do in captivity. Um, also platypuses aren't at the stage where they need captive breeding. So um, it is much better, more efficient, more successful to protect animals in the wild than it is to rely on a captive breeding program. So I would I would hope we never get to the stage where we have to do um, captive breeding for platypuses. Um, if we're at that stage, they are on the verge of extinction and we will not recover them. So um, the most, if we're going to do reintroductions of platypus, the most feasible way is to do wild to wild translocations. Um, the problem being is that if platypus have disappeared from an area, the habitat is probably not uh, suitable to support them anymore. So uh, it's a very difficult, it's very difficult to judge whether habitats are, are suitable again. Um, but we are going to start to see that happening more and more in the future as we're getting more localized extinctions and um, and also you know some really good rehabilitation, habitat rehabilitation programs. So um, but yeah it'll certainly be a wild translocation rather than um, captive breeding. Hmm. Thanks, Josh. Uh, over to the Q&A now, we have Cian. Um, hope I pronounced that right. Uh, are platypus used as a keystone umbrella species in regards to protecting and conserving a wider range of native aquatic flora and fauna? Absolutely. And, and this is why these seminars happen. Um, really, this is about raising awareness of waterway health um, platypus are, have that cute, furry, charismatic um, advantages. It's very hard to get people excited about 
mayfly larvae. Um, but essentially, those are the kind of things that we're trying to protect in our waterways, not just for platypus, but for fish that feed on them. Um, yeah, we absolutely use platypus as a flagship species for, for waterways. Um, also, because, I mean, because they're cute and furry and people are interested in them, um, but also because their habitat requirements are very general. So the kind of work that we do to improve habitats for platypus have massive advantages for everything else in that waterway. So, um, yes, absolutely, they're a fantastic uh, flagship species for waterways. Mm, good question, Sam. Uh, Suzanne asks, does the presence of platypus DNA mean platypus are there at that point in time or they have been there in the past? Yeah, good question. So um, it's relatively real time. So DNA in surface water, at least, um, tends to persist for anything from a couple of days to about a week. So we're not picking them up you know, months ago, we know that they've been active in that area relatively um, recently. You can get uh, a longer time span if you look at things like um, sediment cores from waterways. Um, I think that goes back for months or even years. Um, you can get DNA persisting in those areas. But yeah, our eDNA stuff from surface water is, um, yes, they are present at this pretty much in the last few days. Um, Tony asks, what effect has lining creeks had on platypus populations? So that means like lining creeks with, say, rocks or, or concrete, making them into drains rather than, um, you know, natural creeks. Um, well, I mean, one of their key requirements is being able to burrow into the bank. So as soon as we use concrete or pavers or whatever it is to create drains, they are no longer suitable for platypus. Um, the other thing is, is it, is it removes any habitat for the bugs to live in. So, you know, essentially it becomes a drain and no longer a, a natural waterway. Um, so yes, it, it essentially ruins the entire ecosystem. And thankfully, I don't think that really happens anymore. And in fact, there's quite a few programs around the place in terms of Renaturalizing creeks, um, even ones that have been piped under the ground, they are now being, um, I can't remember what the term is, to basically open them up and make them into natural creeks again. Um, it, it's a massive engineering effort to do that, but thankfully the way that we manage waterways now is very different to what it used to be sort of 30, 50 years ago. Mm. Yeah, good question, Tony. Um, Tom, us as a uh, as a natural resource management crew member in the western region, which includes a Maribyrnong catchment and Werribee catchment, he wants to know what he can do to improve platypus habitat. Are there any particular plant species or weeds to eradicate, either in stream or surrounding vegetation? Should um, we, yeah, should we introduce snags, etc.? Uh, I mean, yes to all of those to a certain extent. Um, look, reintroducing snags is, is, a, is a great one. Um, so in-stream complexity is really important to support the macroinvertebrates, which then support platypuses. So, you know, if you, if you can identify that waterways are missing those, uh, those snags, those large woody debris in waterways, then yes, that can be beneficial. Um, in terms of species that you plant around waterways, um, we certainly know that, you know, willows, even though they're, they're trees and they can help, some, you know, stabilise banks, they're nowhere near as good a habitat as, you know, sort of diverse natural vegetation. So certainly removing monocultures of willows and replacing it with um, you know, large trees and woody undergrowth that's that's native to the area is good, not just for platypus, but for biodiversity in general. Um, a, a lot of it comes down to suitable flow regimes. And in the West and North in particular, you know, the major concerns are, are simply the um, urban development in those areas and how that's going to impact waterways, um, which is probably outside of Tony's remit. Um, but, you know, the more that we can have buffer zones around waterways that we can, you know, maintain riparian veg instead of building right up to the edge of it, 
um, is going to help maintain ecosystem functions. Mm, so essentially, more co- the more complex and more native plant species, the better. The there was a really good, really good waterway <laughs> talk I saw a few years ago that its title was basically "Messy rivers are healthy rivers." So mm. we want complexity. We want different depths. We want different flows. We want lots of bends and turns. So. Often they don't look pretty, but that's what supports healthy healthy waterways. Cool. Um, Helen asks again: Is anyone checking on the impact of heavy metals and emerging contaminants on platypus? Now, I don't know if you're in the scope to answer that, Josh. Um, but... um, yes. I mean, the short answer is, is no, uh, not not directly. People tend to look at those things and the impacts on macroinvertebrates. Um, the reason being is that you normally have to munch them up and to be able to test tissues. Um, certainly, I believe there was some work done on heavy metals and pesticides in Tasmania a few years ago. And I think that from memory, the conclusion was that they certainly found them in um, tail fat of platypuses, but it didn't at that time, it didn't seem to be having uh, an adverse reaction. Um, they are the head of the food chain in a lot of these areas. So if things are, if there's things that are bioaccumulating in macroinvertebrates, then there's certainly a risk that they are then going to get passed on to platypuses. Um, and I have had people ask me about trying to get tissue samples. I remember there was a, a study that came out a few years ago around pharmaceuticals in streams and they were finding them in macroinvertebrates. And yeah, a few research groups are sort of going, well, can we look at platypus as well? Unfortunately, I can't go and take slices out of platypuses to, well, maybe fortunately I can't go take slices out of platypuses. Um, so it's whether we can look at them in say hair samples or um, you know, even maybe a, a small blood sample that's gonna be pretty, you know, l- relatively non-invasive. Mm. Uh, good response there, Josh. Um, Final question so far, we have Noreen who asks, do platypus have to live in fresh water? Um, y- yes, but they do They do go into brackish waters. Um, so estuarine areas, we certainly find them. Um, whether they live there permanently or they're just kind of moving down to forage, those estuarine areas can be really productive. Um, so they might just use it as a bit of foraging and then um, move back up into the fresh water. Um, they've even been known to go out into uh, marine environments when they um, historically, one of the ways that they used to disperse is they would come down waterways out into the ocean, swim along the coast a little bit and then back up the next river system much easier than crossing land. Um, but yeah, they, they don't live permanently in those areas, um, except for maybe, you know, upper estuaries. Um, but yeah, they're pretty tolerant of a range of different conditions. As long as there's, as long as conditions are fine to support lots of food, they tend to be pretty happy. Um, and I've certainly caught them in a range of different sort of water quality areas um some that i was quite surprised at even sort of things like uh poo ponds i found them foraging in which platypus might have enjoyed i didn't like catching a bit of very much <laughs> mm. well that's it for the questions josh unless anyone has any last minute uh questions um i think that's it um five minutes to go Thanks so much, Josh, for the really informative presentation on platypus monitoring. And um, yeah, always looking forward to what's next. <laughs> yeah, well, certainly the, um, I mean, I mean the, the next stage from my point of view is, is what can we do with all this data now that we, we've got it? I mean, that's why we collect it. We collect the data to be able to make better decisions around our, our management processes. Um, and so, yeah, how can we use that data to help support uh, you know, people like Tony had asked that question before around, you know, how can he as, a, as an NRM practitioner help um, and, you know, the people making the decisions within Melbourne Water and CMAs about how we can put hard data behind those decisions. Mm. Yeah, so thanks once again, Josh. We've had people tuning in from London saying thank you. Um, 
So, and thanks everyone for attending. Uh, really appreciate it. And yeah, hopefully can see you out in a volunteer capacity in the future or tuning into these future webinars. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate the discussion. Cheers. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again, Josh. And uh, just one last request, if um, if people could click on the link for our feedback survey, just to let us know, um, yes, if you appreciated it, uh, and uh, give us a bit of direction in terms of um, other topics we might be able to cover and um, other experts we could get out in the field, or um, we'll probably get Josh on in the future again. I'm sure at some stage he gives an update um, on some of the future rounds of sampling. Um, but yeah, it'd be great if people could um, yeah give us a little bit of feedback on this session. Great. Uh, and if anyone wants some more information on um, our program, you can check out the links that are on the screen at the moment. Um, so we've got a couple of links for um, the previous, um, you can check out the previous videos that have been uh, recorded through this series uh, and any further kind of inquiries that you have around, you know, adequate activities with Melbourne Water um, to science opportunities, we've got our email address down at the bottom. You can get in touch with us as well. Uh, and um, yeah, for any other further info on the great work that Josh has been doing, um, you can check out Enviro DNA um, and Caesar and Platypus Spot is also a really cool interactive um, system that they've got for Platypus sites. Yeah, thanks, Richard. I, I forgot to speak Platypus Spot. If you see a platypus in the wild, feel free to use that app to upload the sighting. All right, thanks, everyone. So.